girlfriends, happy 2020. My goodness, a new year from what they say, a new decade for many of us, kind of a, a new season of life. And, and truly, at the start of the year, that's a time for us to really maybe take on some new challenges. What is God unveiling or what is God revealing to us? And, and one of the things that we really, I think, need to be passionate about as followers of Jesus is the power of prayer. Now, uh, starting tomorrow, uh, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. In fact, if you have your phones with you right now, I invite you to take them out, okay? Starting tomorrow, we're going to lift and join our voices and prayers together as we go to God for 21 days of prayer. Here's, here's how it works, okay? You take out your phone. This is what you're going to do. Text the word CHAPEL to 313131. And each morning for the next 21 days, you're going to receive a prompt to pray. And you're going to be given something about which we're called to pray. A different item, a different thing to pray about each and every day for the next 21 days. It's a challenge, but it's a way for us to, to enter together into the power and the presence of God. Again, text the word CHAPEL, 313131. Now, friends, this morning we kick off our first series of the new year. For each of the next three weeks, we'll be taking you on a road trip. Why? To where? Well, hopefully you're going to find out. I think back to some of the memorable road trips that I went on. I remember when I was in college, my buddies and I would just get in the car and we'd, we'd go on a road trip somewhere. Uh, sometimes it was very memorable. It was really special. Uh, sometimes the memories, uh, maybe they're not uh, so good. Uh, but truthfully, the image of a road is often used as a metaphor for the Christian life. In fact, for the early followers of Jesus, before they became known as Christians, they were referred to as the way. Jesus, we're following him the way. Jesus is the way. That certainly points to the imagery of a journey. So uh, this morning, I want to look at a road trip uh, that Jesus took his disciples on. What was the purpose? Why did Jesus do that? And, and how did the disciples respond to that? Well, I hope that we're going to find that out this morning. So I want to take you to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, and we're going to start off with verse 13. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? It's easy to to focus on the question that Jesus asked. After all, if the scripture tells us that, that Jesus asked a question, then we obviously know it's, it's pretty important. But, but before we tackle that question, I want us to look a little bit earlier in that verse. Before we tackle the question, let's go back, let's rewind to the start of verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, Okay, Joe, I don't know what you're getting at this morning. It simply says that Jesus took his disciples to a certain place. Uh, well, I want to give you a little bit of a backstory because I think that's really important uh, to what we're going to talk about this morning. It's very important as a backstory to the question that Jesus posed to his disciple. So, uh, so, so this narrative, it occurs really towards the end of Jesus' public ministry. He'd been setting the stage for what was to come his arrest and his crucifixion, then his resurrection. But uh, the disciples, uh, they're kind of hard-headed at times. They, they don't yet quite get uh, the message that Jesus is trying to convey. Uh, so here, Jesus, to, to, to really get his disciples to, to leave their comfort zone, to really focus on the question that he's asking, he takes the disciples on an incredible road trip, an exciting journey. And like I said, you have to understand the backstory of Caesarea Philippi before we get to the question that he asked. Okay, Caesarea Philippi, it's about a, a two-day journey from the region of Galilee. Uh, the disciples were from the region of Galilee, that's north of Jerusalem. That was kind of the home base, if you will, of Jesus's public ministry. Uh, Galilee was a very devout, a very religious Jewish area. Uh, but Caesarea Philippi, on the other hand, was radically different. Here's why. Originally, the Greeks took this region, this area, and they named it Peneus in honor of the Roman god Pan. Now, later, the, the Roman Empire, they, they kind of conquered the area of Peneus, and, and they renamed it 
Herod Philippi, he was the ruler of this area. There's a shrine that's located still to Pan in this place, but he changes the name of it. He does a lot of improvements. He enhances it a lot. And so he names it after himself, Caesarea Philippi. To say that the, uh, the ruler had an ego would, would be kind of an understatement. He, in fact, had his image engraved on all of the coins that were distributed and used in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Okay, it was also known by another name. Caesarea Philippi, okay, just hold on to that name for a second. It was referred to as the gates of hell. Why? Because the pagans there, they believed that their pagan gods, uh, they lived underground, underneath Caesarea Philippi, and they would come out each and every spring. Uh, so each year, the pagan people would do these uh, detestable acts. Uh, they referred to it as acts of worship, but they were far from it. It was their way of trying to entice the pagan gods, especially the pagan god Pan, uh, to, to kind of swell up, to, to come out and to bless the people. Okay, and so as a way to try to entice the, the gods to, to come up out of the underground, uh, they had children who were sacrificed. They were killed to appease uh, the pagan gods. The, there was prostitution in the, uh, the, the, the pagan temple as a way to, again, appease the Roman gods. Uh, you had followers of, of these gods who, who did some really... For, for lack of a better word, and I know we've got kids in here, uh, but they would do things with animals that, that were really kind of detestable. That's the way the, the pagans were in the region of Caesarea Philippi. It, it was a really scary place to be. To the Jewish people, the, the pagan region was a place that you never wanted to step foot in. In fact, you would stay as far away as you could from Caesarea Philippi. You wouldn't want to go into this area with a 10-foot pole. And yet here it is, Jesus taking his disciples from Galilee, this, this strict uh, Jewish area where they were working and their families lived there, and Jesus took them to Caesarea Philippi. It represented to the disciples all that was wrong with the world. It was also an intimidating place for the disciples because the region was heavily controlled and occupied by the Roman Empire. Jewish people just didn't head into Caesarea Philippi uh, for a lot of different reasons. But Jesus takes his disciples on a road trip right to the gates of hell as Caesarea Philippi was known. Uh, this... I mean, I don't want to speak in hyperbole, but, but it would almost be like taking a, a class of middle, middle school students to like a red light district. I mean, it was that, uh, that scandalous that Jesus was taking his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. And it was here that Jesus asks a poignant question to his disciples. What does he ask? This is what he says. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Uh, the Son of Man, uh, by the way, was a title that Jesus used to identify himself with the fact that he was uh, totally human and yet totally divine. Very often Jesus is referred to, obviously, as the Son of God, but Jesus also used the phrase or the term Son of Man to describe his human mission. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Verse 14 the disciples replied, uh, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others say you're Jeremiah or maybe one of the other prophets. I don't understand that. John, John the Baptist, okay. Elijah, uh, Jeremiah, the other prophets. These are kind of like a who's who or a Mount Rushmore of, of Jewish lore. But the responses also show how bitterly divided the people who were the early followers of Jesus really were. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they were kind of the upper crust of that culture. They were the religious leaders. They bitterly uh, disputed Jesus' claim that, that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. They were bitterly hostile, in fact, towards Jesus and his mis uh, ministry. And the crowds and the masses who uh, started to, to follow Christ, started to follow Jesus, they, they were often uh, divided, too, on what they thought. Uh, very often they were superficially following Jesus because they were hoping and praying that he would be the one who would fend off the Roman occupation. But how much did the disciples fully understand the one whom they were following? Did they understand Jesus? Did they understand his mission, his vision, and his ministry? 
So that's the next question that Jesus asked. Okay, who do people say that I am? Okay, he asked that question. The disciples gave him some, uh, some really good answers, a wide variety of answers, again, showing how divided people really were on who Jesus really was. But who do you say that I am? Verse 15, what about you, Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? What a, uh, what a powerful and a, and a poignant question. How would the disciples answer? Uh, well, the disciple Peter, he, he gave the, the first answer. He was the first one to, to share his opinion. This is what he says. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God living God. You see, the pagan religions, they had these shrines of things from, from yesteryear, uh, things from the past, but, but the one living God, he's the God not only of the past, but a God of the present and a God of the future. You are the Messiah, Peter says, the son of the living God. Uh, now, good answer. Uh, for several centuries, the Jewish people, they had awaited, they had longed for, they had prayed for, they had anticipated uh, the Messiah, uh, the Christ, the one who was sent by God, as they thought, to, to, to fend off again the Roman Empire. But Jesus really came to, to fend off shame and sin and death and separation from God. Peter's response, though, was spot on. And Jesus affirmed Peter's response. In Matthew 16, 17, 18, and 19, this is what Jesus says. Blessed are you, Simon, the son of Jonah. That, that was how he referred to Peter, at least in this instance. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, uh, now Jesus is saying a lot. There's a lot to unpack here. We're, we're not going to do that right here and right now. But, but Jesus is making a pun of sorts when he talks about Peter's name. Uh, the, the name Peter, when transliterated from English into Aramaic, literally means rock. A rock, what do you think of with a rock? You, you think of a, a stable, steady place, a, a place of strength, a, a place that's sturdy. And so Jesus is saying that the, the church is going to be built on something rock solid. Nothing will be able to overtake or defeat the church that Jesus is ushering in. It's going to be rock solid. Nothing will be able to defeat it or overtake it. Not even the gates of Hades, Jesus says, the gates of hell. Uh, what do we talk about with the gates of hell? What was the area where we are? Caesarea Philippi, the gates of hell. Even the pagan practices of a very secular culture could not upend the church, Jesus is saying. Not even the wicked forces of evil can upend the church. So in verse 20, Jesus makes a seemingly unusual command. He ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Some people already thought that he was. Others weren't quite sure. But why would Jesus suggest such a thing? Well, if the disciples proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah, huge numbers of people would seek to identify themselves with Jesus. They, they wanted his Messiahship, for lack of a better term, to unfold differently than Jesus was going to see it unfold. Jesus wanted people to, to truly sense and believe that he was sent by God, that he was the Messiah. He didn't want people to jump on some sort of political bandwagon. And so he concealed the truth to a lot of folks for a little bit longer. And so Jesus takes his disciples on a scary field trip, a road trip to Caesarea Philippi, a really radical and scary and evil place. And it was there that they would come face to face with their own view of Jesus. Who do you say I am? He asks. Man, Jesus really pulled them out of their comfort zone on this trip. He took them to a place where they, they certainly didn't want to go. He wanted them to fully understand their rationale for following him. And Jesus still does that to you and me here and now today on the verge of a new year. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is Jesus merely a great teacher? Yeah, he was. Is Jesus merely a, a wonderful role model? Well, he was. Is Jesus merely a captivating preacher? Yeah, I guess he was. 
Or is Jesus truly who Jesus says he is? The son of God sent to rescue and redeem God's people. C.S. Lewis said this about Jesus. Either this man was and is the son of God, or he's a madman, or maybe something worse. When we refer to to Jesus as Savior, we're acknowledging that, that we need rescuing. We need redemption from our sin. We're admitting that that we can't do it ourselves. But many of us try to do just that, and I'm the the poster child for this, okay? I'm the the chief sinner amongst us when when it comes to trying to do things in my own flesh and my own strength. We try to do enough good things to, to maybe win God's approval, or we try to be maybe nice enough for God to take notice. We focus on on doing, doing the right things, saying the right things. Yeah, certainly we don't live perfect lives, but I think my life is a heck of a lot better than that guy's over there. Or maybe your life is a heck of a lot better than that person's over there. But that's not the way God wants us to view things. You see, only when we realize that we can't save ourselves do we truly see the need to accept the gift of God's Savior. As I get older and older, there are a lot of things that don't work the way that they used to. And, and I'll acknowledge to, to, to my friends and family that, that my hearing is not as good as it used to be. Uh, we'll be at a restaurant, for example, and, and I can't hear the person literally sitting you know, three feet from me. Now, I hear all the ambient noise in the background, uh, but I can't listen or I can't hear the person who's right in front of me. So uh, a couple years ago, I went to have my hearing checked. You know, they put you in a room and, and nothing happens for like 20 minutes. But stuff is supposed to happen. I, I just didn't hear it. And so the doctor came back and he said, you know, you really might want to go get a fitting for a hearing aid. So I went to a place where they sell hearing aids and, and the guy pulled out like this top of the line hearing aid. It, it cost more than my first car. And I said, you know, we got to try something else. He said, you know, no one's going to notice it because it's so stealthy. It's so sleek and modern. So when I told him that I really didn't want to spend that much on a hearing aid, he he went in the back and pulled out this old rusty kind of a a clunker looking of of a hearing aid. It had this massive, really noticeable earpiece, a long white cord that that traveled down to a unit that you would wear on your belt. I mean, it was bulky. It was hideous. It it was just so obtrusive. And I asked him, does it work well? And he said, honestly, it doesn't work at all. But but when people see you wearing it, they're going to talk louder. (laughs) Um, I shared that because Jesus often talks about how we need eyes to see and ears to hear. He's talking about the ways in which we are truly looking for and listening to the presence of God. How is God calling you out of your comfort zone? How is God taking you to to radical and even scary places? I think back to my early days in in full-time ministry after I left uh, the the sportscasting career and was following God's call. uh, As I've shared before, I kind of hesitated for a while and just kind of delayed that response that that God was calling me to to respond to. And and after I was in full-time ministry for a short period of time, I wanted to do something radical. And so what was radical? Well, I started a prison ministry at a maximum security prison. I would go and I would lead a a Bible study with these hardened and often violent criminals, these violent men. And you talk about being scared. Oh my gosh, I would like to say, I'd really like to tell you that that after a while I got comfortable and and they responded well to me and, and they got my back and I felt safe. That's not the way it worked out. I never quite felt at home there, uh, but I wanted to be obedient to what I felt like God was calling me to do. But there's still a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation when I was there. Uh, Sometimes responding to God means going to places that you would never want to go to on your own. At my former church in Canton, we had a really solid relationship with people in the country of Haiti, the, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And we would do medical mission trips there, but very often the medical supplies would be uh, 
captured by the, the customs agents and, and we would never see them again. Uh, we had to go everywhere with an armed guard because there had been some kidnappings of, of some leaders uh, from churches who were there to, to help the people, people within their poverty. And again, it was kind of a scary place at first. After a while, I did fall in love with the people there and, and I went back over and over and over again because I felt like that's what God was calling me to do. And you know what? God may not be calling you to start a prison ministry. God may not be calling you to go on a mission trip to Haiti. Maybe he is. But maybe Jesus is calling you to, I don't know, maybe reach out to that neighbor down the street whom you don't know. Or maybe Jesus is calling you to bring light and to bring hope to the last and the least and the lost in your neighborhood or your community in your church, in your schools, in your workplaces. Maybe Jesus is calling you to, uh, to do something that betters the lives of people who are hurting here in our own backyard. Or maybe Jesus is calling you to, to let go of those things that keep you from truly being faithful and obedient to what God wants you to do. I don't know what God is calling you to. There are times I'm not quite sure I know what God is calling me to. But I do know that God will equip those whom he has called. That God isn't focusing on your ability as much as he is your availability. Your willingness to say, here I am. I, God, will go where you send me. God has deliberately designed and equipped, enabled and empowered his people to do radical things. To bring light and love and hope to a dark and hurting world. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I do know he's calling. He calls all of us. Uh, what is he calling you to do? What, what is he challenging you to reach out toward? Uh, through Chapel Roswell and, and, and the bigger RUMC church, there are so many ways that we have to serve others through, through mission trips, local and, and international, even some in our own backyard. Uh, so many opportunities to make a difference in the lives of people here and now and maybe people far, far away. Uh, but by teaching or praying for others or by rocking babies in the nursery, God is using you for something special. Do you want to be used by God? Do you really want to partner with God in the ways that he is making a difference in the lives of so many people? It starts with our response to this question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Are you willing to pursue the ways in which God has equipped, enabled, and empowered you to serve and live out your lives? But I know in my life, in the past, when I look back, I acknowledge that I haven't always lived out the, the life that God wanted me to live out. I've missed a lot of the incredible opportunities, the, uh, the blessings, and yeah, the challenges that maybe God had in store for me. Here's what I discovered about my life. Again, I can't speak for you. I repent enough to be forgiven but do I surrender enough to be changed? Think about that. Do you repent enough to be forgiven, but do you surrender enough to be changed? We may have an easy time proclaiming Jesus is Savior, but are we able to look at our lives and say, yeah, I follow Jesus as Lord? You see, by staying stranded in our comfort zones, we, we don't fully experience and realize all that God is calling us to do. do. Do we totally relinquish control to God or are we constantly fighting for control? You see, part of living our lives for Christ means that we accept the truth about who Jesus says he is, about the identity that Jesus claims and proclaims for himself, his purpose, his example, his messiahship. But part of living our lives for Christ means that we also accept the truth about who Jesus says you are. For some of us, that's a, that's a radical concept. After all, in our culture, there are expectations that continually bombard us. 
The world says, for example, that you, you're successful if you live in that neighborhood or, or you've made it if you're driving that kind of car. The, the world says that you're attractive if, if you look like these uh, models in a magazine, for example. And certainly people around us, our family, our friends, even the people whom we love and care for the most will often place expectations that, 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 that are placed on us. And sometimes we can't fulfill those and we worry about the, the fact that maybe we disappoint those people whom we love. And if we're not firmly rooted in the power and the promise and the word of God, it's easily distracting and disconnecting us from what God wants us to do. That's not how God wants you to live our lives. God wants you and God wants me to experience freedom, peace, but we often allow ourselves to be held uh, as an emotional hostage, if you will, by the expectations and the demands that other people place upon us. Here's what we often believe about ourselves. I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what other people say about me. Those are three lies that we often fall victim to. Each and every day, we, we face those problems. I, I am what I have. That defines me. That's my identity. I am what I do. Uh, my vocation uh, or my stage in life, uh, that defines me. That, that speaks to my identity. I am what other people think of me. Uh, we're allowing others to, uh, to, to provide our identity instead of allowing God to do that. These are three lies that you and I face each and every day. And the truth is this. Friends, you were lovingly created by God who is is for you and not against you. Despite your sin or your shame or your mistakes or your failings or your fallings, God saved you from something and God saved you for something. Maybe the start of a new year will bring about a, a new or a fresh perspective about the role that, that Christ wants to play in your life. Maybe the start of a new year will bring about maybe the, the courage or, or maybe the boldness to say, yeah, Christ, I'm really going to follow you. Even when he leads you to places that are downright scary, places that are way, way, way out of your comfort zone. Uh, maybe the, the start of a new year will bring about the strength to live out that identity that comes not from our culture, not from other people, but that identity that comes straight from your creator. Who do you say Jesus is? And who does God say that you are? Friends, as we embark on a new year, a new season, even a, a new decade, may you respond to the challenges, the call, the faithfulness, the obedience that God is asking you and challenging you and calling you to live out. Uh, can we do that? Because that's what God is asking. That's what God is calling us to do. Are we willing to relinquish the control that we have to say, yes, Jesus, I trust you and I will follow you. I need you not just as a savior, but also as my Lord. We pray with me. Dear loving God, we thank you for the amazing love that you have for us. God, may we seek our worth and our approval, not from what the world says about us, but, but based on what you say. Uh, Lord, you know the hurts or the fears that we might be facing. You know our health issues or the financial constraints or the relationships that need healing. And in the stillness and silence of this time and place, Father, we lift up our cares and our concerns to you. Thank you for the amazing love that you have for us and the many blessings that you continually pour out upon us. May we really be transformed by your presence in our lives. And may those around us be blessed by our presence in their lives because of your presence in ours. Father God, as we prepare our hearts and minds for Holy Communion, May we come with repentant hearts. May we truly understand the, the depths of your love, even when compared to the depth of our own sin. We love you, Lord God, and we thank you for first loving us. And we pray these things in Jesus' most holy and precious and powerful name. Amen.